So I'm going to be talking to you about the marginalisation of, of people with particularly complex mental health problems, as soon as I can attach this to my lapel. Um, and I want to start by illustrating that with the story um, of a man called John. I hope you'll excuse me reading a little bit from notes, but it, it's a bit of a, a complicated story. So John is a 32-year-old Caucasian man. He was born in London. His father is a retired clerk and his mother is a cleaner. He has two older sisters, one of whom has a diagnosis of schizophrenia, and his older sister is married with one child and lives locally. Um, John's early development was unremarkable, but and at secondary school he was reported as a, a quiet, hard worker. He had a network of friends and he was predicted to pass 10 GCSEs. Around the age of 14, he and his friends started to be bullied, and on one particular occasion, they were assaulted and money was taken from them. And after that, John stopped attending school, and in fact, he's never returned to education. At the age of 16, he started to experience physical symptoms and recurrently presented himself to casualty department, um, saying that he felt very unwell. He also became increasingly hostile towards his family. His GP thought he might be depressed and referred him to the local community mental health team, but he failed to attend appointments there, and when they attempted to visit him at home, he wouldn't see them. About a year later, his GP again called for help from the community mental health team because John had become preoccupied with religious ideas, believing himself to be possessed by the devil. He was treated with an antipsychotic medication, but he had terrible side effects, and he wouldn't take it. And within a month, he'd become so unwell that he was admitted to hospital under the Mental Health Act. Right. At this time, he'd become very withdrawn. He wouldn't leave his bedroom. He wasn't eating. He'd lost an awful lot of weight. And again, he was very preoccupied with these religious ideas. A lot of different medications were tried, um, but he didn't like them, and he basically wouldn't take them. Eventually, it was decided that he needed to be treated with injectable antipsychotic medication, and he got better, and he was discharged with a diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia. Back home, he wouldn't accept the injections, and after a short period of time, he relapsed and again required admission to hospital. This happened once or twice more. On one occasion, he became very aggressive at home, threatening to kill his parents, and actually held a knife to his sister's throat. He was acutely psychotic at the time, and he was again admitted. And during this admission, he was transferred to our inpatient rehabilitation unit. There he actually progressed quite well. We changed his medication and his symptoms stabilised. But he didn't engage with staff, he didn't engage with occupational therapy or psychology, he didn't engage with other patients on the ward at all. He didn't really understand or accept that he'd been mentally unwell and he declined the offer of moving into supported accommodation when he left hospital. He insisted on going back to the family home. Rather predictably, once that happened, he stopped taking his medication again and there was a further relapse. He was readmitted, and on that occasion, he did agree to take oral medication, and he agreed to move to a supported flat. But that fell apart very quickly. Within a few weeks, he'd stopped taking the medication, stopped seeing the support team who were visiting him, and he required a further readmission. And he came again to our inpatient rehabilitation unit during that admission. <coughs> he was very unwell at this point, very thin, very pale. He rarely left his room. He was completely preoccupied with delusional themes. He wouldn't take oral medication. He insinuated that he was hearing voices telling him not to accept the medication, and once again we had to resort to injectables. There was some improvements over subsequent months. He became a little bit warmer in his demeanour. He was eating better, but he remained very preoccupied and withdrawn. And there were very bizarre behaviours. He started flushing his clothes down the toilet, and he started breaking crockery onto the floor. In one brief but rather lucid conversation I had with him about that, he said he was being forced to break the crockery. He said, the pieces reflect my situation. And tearfully he said, I can't put it back together again. And I told him that perhaps we needed to hold the pieces for him for a while. He didn't engage in any activities on the unit. And when he went home to visit family, he nearly always required the police to bring him back because he didn't want to be in hospital. Ultimately, his parents declined to have him home when he left hospital, and there then ensued a six-month standoff where he refused to have anything to do with the staff in the unit. He refused to think about discharge plans to supported accommodation, and he complained vociferously about his medication and about being detained under the Mental Health Act. Two years into this admission, we took a therapeutic risk. 
we negotiated that he would agree to visit supported accommodation and take oral medication if we took him off his section. Unfortunately, he was unable to really to, to follow through on this, and things got worse because he simply didn't take in medication. He became acutely unwell again and required, required to be re-detained under the Mental Health Act. After a tribunal upheld his detention, he was so angry that he smashed up the games room on the inpatient rehabilitation unit and had to be moved to the intensive care unit and nursed in seclusion for a few days due to the level of his aggression. He was extremely psychotic, he was pacing, gesticulating, talking to himself. Various medications were tried, but really he just got worse and worse, and there were increasingly bizarre behaviours. He started putting things up his nose, taking his clothes off, and on one occasion he tied a T-shirt around his neck and tried to hang himself. Now you can imagine the distress that his family were feeling through all of this, and after much discussion with them and with the clinicians involved, we decided to try him on a new medication, a complicated medication, and one that needed him to have blood tests, and to do that we had to agree that we would restrain him to have those blood tests. The, med the medication is called clozapine. We went ahead and did that, and actually it had an enormous effect on him, a huge improvement. His symptoms resolved very quickly, and in fact we were able then to discharge him to a community-based rehabilitation unit. But he continued to complain of side effects and started going off to the accident and emergency department again with recurrent physical complaints. He kept stopping the medication and having to be readmitted in order to restabilize him and put him back on it. On the third time that this happened, he was detained under the Mental Health Act and his discharge was made conditional. In other words, he was placed on a community treatment order that said that he had to take this medication in order to stay out of hospital. We were able to discharge him after that admission to a different community rehabilitation unit. And that was in 2011, and I'm pleased to say that since then he has remained out of hospital and he's remained on his medication. His attitude towards medication has changed in that he says he thinks that the medication helps him stay calm, but he's not really able to say that he would necessarily continue to take it if he didn't have to. Staff in this unit have helped him to learn or perhaps relearn skills for living in the community. He's able to manage his self-care, his laundry, his shopping, his cooking, things that we just take for granted that he had lost over years. He's also more or less managing his medication independently now, but he has very minimal engagement with the staff and he has a very restricted repertoire of activities. He visits his family most days, but there he just goes to his old bedroom and lies on the bed. He declines suggestions of support with community activities, always saying, I'm, I'm all right, I'm relaxing, I can't take any stress. He doesn't have any acute psychotic symptoms now and he's very calm and he's pleasant. And three years ago, we were able to move him to a supported flat. Our community rehabilitation team provide the clinical input to, pro to, to monitor his progress. And we also provide the physical health care because he won't see his GP. Earlier this year, 17 years since his first admission and 14 years since I first met him, he agreed for the first time to engage with a clinical psychologist and they've begun to talk about his experiences. Now... John is not that unusual. Around 20% of people who are newly diagnosed with psychosis will go on to have very complex problems, a bit like John. And in the UK, mental health rehabilitation services focus on that particular subgroup of people with psychosis. And those services tend to be organised into what we refer to in the trade as a, a whole system care pathway, which includes parts of specialist N NHS services, the inpatient and community rehabilitation units that I described that John had experience of, but also there's very close working partnerships with the voluntary sector who usually provide supported accommodation. And in these services, people are helped to gain stability of their symptoms and to regain some of the function that they may have lost through the course of their illness. But as you can see from this figure, it takes many years. Um, John was a, perhaps a little exceptional in taking a very long time, particularly in the earlier stages, but it's not unusual for people to take somewhere around 10 years. However, when you do have those sorts of systems in place, two-thirds of people like John will do well and achieve successful community living. 
services that are more collaborative and hold therapeutic optimism at their heart that continue to try and continue to work with people like John in order to find the right combination of treatment and support that's going to help him be able to get out and stay out of hospital, those sorts of services are more successful, and, and we refer to that as those that have a recovery orientation. And services that promote people's human rights similarly tend to be more successful. However, at five years, only about 10% of this group will actually be living fully independently. So in other words, 90% continue to need quite a lot of support. That makes some quite expensive bits of the system. Now, despite the good evidence for their effectiveness, the Royal College of Psychiatrists has found that over the last 15 years, 61% of these kinds of rehab services have reported some disinvestment. Around half of all of those inpatient rehab services have actually been closed. And that's happened in a context where these particular bits of the system have been missing from mental health policy. Policy that tends to focus on public mental health initiatives that are about promoting mental health and about preventing mental illness and about intervening early to try and prevent longer-term sequelae. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with that, but the reality is that 20% of people newly diagnosed continue to develop these longer-term and very complex issues. The other thing is that people like John don't have a voice. John found it very difficult to communicate. His family were finding it very difficult to communicate with services at one point as well. They wouldn't have known what to advocate for. And the third issue here is that there are often financial drivers as to why these kinds of services get cut. They're very expensive, and there's a whole load of financial incentives to cost shunting uh, the costs of people like this around different parts of the welfare system. And the impact of all of that is that there's been a huge expansion in the independent sector for these kinds of services. And this was picked up by the Care Quality Commission recently after their comprehensive inspections of mental health services. They noted that there were a lot of people in so-called locked rehabilitation wards, often a long way from home, and they felt that often these services were not exactly rehabilitative in their approach. In fact, they felt that they were really institutions that were getting in the way of people's recovery rather than helping them. Over half of the rehabilitation units in England are now provided in the private sector, and the total cost of all of these services is over half a billion pounds, and two-thirds of that is spent in the independent sector. Compared to those in the NHS, independent sector units more often and most often describe themselves in this term locked rehabilitation. And that's not a service specification. That's something to do with your front door. And it certainly isn't something which fills the heart with therapeutic optimism. They are indeed further from the person's home. And often, apart from the social dislocation that that causes, being away from family and friends and previous networks, it also dislocates you from your local clinical team. And because of that, people tend to overstay. They tend to get stuck there. Their lengths of stay are twice as long, and therefore the costs of these uh, admissions are twice as much as local services. This is a figure published in the BMJ last year. The bars at the bottom are showing the reduction since the 1970s in long-stay beds in mental health, learning disabilities, and older people's services. And the blue line is showing the increase in the number of longer-stay beds in the private sector. And what you can clearly see is that the private sector has far outstripped where we were in the mid-70s. So the idea that we have closed the asylums and deinstitutionalized is simply a myth. And the impact of that is that if you lose your local services, you lose your local specialism. You don't have people who know how to manage people like John, how to help him find his way through. You get into this vicious cycle where your only option is to put somebody in a specialist inpatient bed somewhere out of area, somewhere further away from home in the private sector. <clears throat> and in terms of the principles that are supposed to guide us as mental health practitioners in treating people as close to home and as least restrictive setting as possible, of course, those are very much undermined. So my thoughts on this are that we continue to place people like John at risk of being put in settings which leave them out of sight and out of mind. And we've got to do something about that. Thanks very much. <laughs>